Hey everybody, welcome to another episode. Today we've got a great podcast for you because Nathan and I are talking about the best new car deals out there according to Consumer Reports. We're talking about our forever cars. We're talking about your questions that you folks have been asking. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be a good podcast. I agree, and I like to say orale vato to everybody out there. The most important thing right now is the fact that we have cars that you might be able to actually afford. Um, but before we even start this list, you may want to become an Italian fan <laughs> because a majority of these vehicles, well, you'll see, you'll see. I'm going I'm to keep you in suspense for just a little bit. It's, it's pretty awesome. There's a few vehicles from Italy on this list <laughs> and a few vehicles from a bunch of other countries. Yes, yes, yes. It's interesting. You're going to see a bit of a pattern. So Consumer Reports follows the car market very, very closely. And, um, of course, they are a subscription-driven service and they're they're very ethical in the way that they do their business. So I, I do trust this list in you know, the best incentives out there. And they broke it down based on category and based on segment. So uh, basically what, what they looked at is the potential savings below MSRP. So it's looking like the higher the number, the more savings below MSRP. Hey, podcast listeners and TFL Talk viewers. I wanted to take a minute to talk to you about a quick and simple way to sell your car or truck with the help of our new partner, High Road. With High Road's online portal, you enter your vehicle's VIN number or plate, mileage, and zip code, and you'll get competing offers from several qualified dealers in your area within seconds. You pick the best deal offered and follow through with the dealer to sell your car. No more managing scammy emails from buyers on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. No more time wasted on no-show buyers. No bait and switch with a will you take a check excuse from sketchy buyers. Now keep in mind, these offers will be for trade-in values of your vehicle. If you want to go through the hassle of getting more for your car, that's up to you. But if you want to sell your car hassle free and fast, Go to tflcar.com and click sell your car in the navigation menu or click on the high road ad at the bottom of the website if you're on mobile or click on the column if you're on a desktop. High road makes it easy and we like easy. And uh, let's start out, Nathan, with the vehicle very near and dear to you. The Hyundai Santa Cruz can be had for 10% or more below MSRP. What do you think of that? I think it really sucks because I'm trying to sell mine right now <laughs> and it's not helping for the uh, used car price. Now, it makes it makes total sense. For one thing, uh, the Santa Cruz sales numbers are down year over year. If you compare that to the Maverick, the Maverick sales are significantly higher year over year. Uh, but with the Santa Cruz, uh, I think one of the reasons why Maybe because I believe it was at the New York Auto Show, they introduced a, not an entirely new one, but one with a new face and some other little gizmos on it that really gave it a bit more of a contemporary overall look. It had tow hooks and stuff like that as well. And I believe that introducing that has uh, weakened the market and weakened the desire for those little pickups. Yeah, so um, this in specific is talking about the XRT all-wheel drive, which is the quote unquote kind of off roady one uh, that gives you some like additional design cues that are supposed to make it look more adventurous. That's an MSRP of 40,100. Are you gonna miss your Santa Cruz, Nathan? Mm, a little bit. It, it was a really good uh, daily driver and it was a very utilitarian little guy. I probably hauled almost every other week that I had it, I had something in the bed of that thing. Wow. I, I hauled more than most people do with their full size pickup trucks. And I put over a thousand pounds in the bed and it's managed. But you know, at the end of the day, it's still a very small vehicle, and it is something that I don't really need moving towards Los Angeles. Long story there. You guys can see that in other videos. But anyway, yeah, I'll miss it a little bit. I And my wife liked it quite a bit because she bought tons of antique furniture to throw in the back of it. Oh, interesting. What are you going to do with all your antique furniture when you're during your move? Yeah, I'm buying uh, TFL Studios 97 Ford Expedition. I'm using that actually to help facilitate a move from here to Los Angeles uh, because it's a good tow vehicle, and so I'll be towing some stuff. And then I'll probably keep it there for a year or two, and it's really big inside, and it should be more than be able to handle the antique furniture that my wife blows all of our kids' savings on. <laughs> 
It is a shockingly big interior. I, it I really just, is, isn't it? I just did a move with that exact vehicle, and um, we could not believe how much. I mean, you like put a ton of stuff in there, and you'd be like, "All right, let's go." And you'd look in there, and there'd still be four or five extra feet <laughs> behind the pile of stuff you put in. Yeah. So it would just keep going. Now the other truck on this list, Nathan, where you can get good potential savings is the 2024 Ram 1500 Bighorn, specifically quad cabs with a six foot four boxes. That's a forty-eight thousand dollar truck, which by modern day standards is pretty reasonable. Potential savings below MSRP, also over ten percent. That's another one that I think is dealing with the fact that there's an all new replacement coming along, the Hurricane engine, essentially a new truck. I mean, there are still some carryover components, but I mean, and that that's really more for the truck channel. But the bottom line there is that we have a new powertrain. Uh, coming into that truck. And as such, we are talking about an all new vehicle coming very soon. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the tw difference between 2024 and 2025, you know, V8 versus that inline six, right? Um, personally, I, I would, if you can get a good deal on a 24, that's where I would be right mm, now. Yeah. You know, I think that, that that's kind of the, the, the Those sweet Those Hemi's are pretty solid engines. Yeah. Yeah, there's quite a few of them still out there on the road. So let's talk about some SUVs because there yes. are a ton of them on this list and certain vehicles that can be had at a pretty good value, starting with the Mitsubishi Outlander. Um, over 6% off MSRP, 33245 It's a lot of car for an all-wheel drive vehicle. Yes, but I believe that's a regular Outlander, not the PHEV. You're exactly right. Yeah, and the regular Outlander, there's nothing wrong with it if you're okay with the fact that essentially what you're doing is you're driving a Nissan Rogue that's slightly longer because they do share a lot of components. Um, I actually am thrilled that uh, Mitsubishi is taking a turn towards being inventive again. Um Unfortunately, the PHEV is not on this list, I don't believe. But this particular vehicle really does, it ticks all the right boxes. The interior is very nice. It rides quite well. There's a decent amount of power. Obviously, if you can afford the PHEV, I think Tommy and I would both agree that it's a really good vehicle. It's it's pretty impressive. Yeah, you know, Mitsubishi for a long time has kind of had a reputation for for building some rather cut rate vehicles compared yeah. to some of the other Japanese competitors. But the Outlander, not the Sport, the Sport is not my favorite vehicle. Oh, no, God, no. But the normal Outlander is actually a very competitive SUV in this smallish SUV segment. And it's one of the few that can be had with seven seats. Right, you can get yep. the three row. I mean, granted, that third row is not usable for full size adults, but for kids, it works. Yeah, but for thirty three grand, two thirty three two forty five, that's a lot of vehicle. I believe it is the least expensive three row any vehicle that is available in the United States. Mm. I, I think you're probably so. on the money there. Yeah. Um, by the way, did you see that they're bringing back some cool stuff from Mitsubishi? Yes, I did. Well, uh, theoretically, we we still don't know for sure. Uh, but they did announce, the president of uh, Mitsubishi North America did announce that there will be uh, a few new vehicles coming to the brand very soon. Uh, part of that is to replace some of the vehicles that they're discontinuing. We're going to lose the Mirage, I believe, this year. Um, and I think a couple other ones are either going to be updated or replaced. But in addition, we are talking about uh, possibly the addition of the Delcia coming to the United States, which we talked about uh, just a couple days ago. Yeah, so we've got um, over at TFL Car, we, we did a whole um, video about the, the Delica coming back. And yeah, I mean, the Delica abroad is like an off-roady, lifted, tall van. Yeah, and I do call it a Delcia, and I know it's the Delica, and I do that on purpose because I'm an idiot. <laughs> I don't know why I always do that. But, I mean, what they previewed in this Momentum 2030 is kind of a slew of new vehicles. I think they're saying one heavily refreshed or all-new vehicle a year from 2026 through 2030. And that includes a couple of SUVs located in the back of this kind of mystic photo that look like they've got some additional ride height. And mm. they're also talking about not only full electric, but also they're continuing with gasoline and hybrids. Yeah, their, their hybrid technology is actually quite good. Overseas, there's a lot of buzz about it. And they're now working with Nissan to actually build uh, some future vehicles with that uh, brand, including pickup trucks that may have a PHEV setup. Now, a quick Quick point here, the uh, Outlander that we were just talking about. Um, there's a pretty easy to believe rumor that they'll have a more off-roady version of that, uh, which may be in this picture, which does have a lift and larger tires and everything else. And think of it along the same terms as like a Nissan Pathfinder, what they did with the Rock Creek and whatnot with a slight lift and better tires and armor. Yeah, no, I, I think it's great. What I would love is like the return of the Montero. Hell yeah. 
That would be awesome. And we'll be talking about the Montero again later on. Yeah, so I'm really excited about that. Um, so other vehicles on this list, Nathan, of deals to be had, we have a lot of Mazda products. <laughs> so apparently Mazda, it's a good time to buy a Mazda through the end of the month, and in some cases through the end of next month as well. But everything from the CX-30 to the CX-5, CX-50, and the CX-90, depending on the trim, you can get... Um, Four, six, seven percent off the MSRP on these vehicles. So, um, if you want a Mazda, apparently now is a good time to start 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 looking for one. I would agree. Now, uh, once again, I believe that the CX ninety that we mentioned is not the uh, PHEV version. No, it's the turbo though. That's a forty two thousand dollar vehicle. I, I prefer. You like the turbo? I huh? love the turbo. I think it's a much more driver friendly vehicle. It doesn't have that extra weight of the not only the battery but of the other components necessary to make it into a plug-in hybrid and i just think it's a really well buttoned together vehicle that for the price gives you an awful lot of luxury for the money i just think it's a great vehicle what do you think of mazda getting into that like inline six turbo world pretty I, cool huh? it's really cool mazda always has impressed me with their powertrains because they managed to make remarkably efficient powertrains that still spin up and really move you. I am a Mazda fan, boy, I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, I, I've owned five of them. Uh, but there's a good reason why, because they're inexpensive, but they're fun to drive and they tend to be pretty reliable. So, you know, I, I, this, these new ones are far more complex, but I really think that CX-90 is impressive. But you know what? That CX-70 really doesn't do it for me. The 70, huh? Yeah, because it just doesn't make any sense. It looks the same as the 90, but just with a chopped rear. Well, I uh. think, Nathan, the the CX-70 and the 90 are mechanically identical. They're, I think the bodies are identical. The only difference is that one has three rows and the other one has two rows. So it's, people in the journalist community are all up in arms about this right now because it's the same car, but you you pay just a little bit less, and they call it a new model, right? Yeah. For getting the two row instead of the three row. I think the back is a little bit different, isn't it? I think it's identical. You think it's I identical? I think the sheet metal is exactly the same. Wow. Yeah. It's just the fact that one has the three row and one has a two row. Yeah, it doesn't make much sense to me because Honda did the same thing with the Pilot and the Passport, but they managed to make the two vehicles look very different. Yeah, and they really and changed the character. The character, yeah. exactly. And... The fact that Mazda didn't do that, I think, is a bit of a crime. So we'll see what happens. I mean, they, they may end up uh, changing the way they approach this. But anyway, let's move on. So the vehicles on this list that are getting the biggest potential savings below MSRP are actually Genesis products. So specifically, the electrified Genesis. So the GV70 electrified, which is a slightly bigger one, and then the GV60, which looks like a spaceship, those are 13 and 14% respectively saving. So really big potential savings on those. Um, I think part of the problem with those, especially when purchasing them, is they don't qualify for the federal tax credit. That is a problem. So they have to put some money on the hood in order to move these when you compare them to like the Tesla products, right? Yeah, I, but I got to tell you, Tommy, the GV70 is one of my favorite electric vehicles. You like that thing? I huh? adore it. I, I've I've asked for it by name more than once when I've gone out to California to drive it. It, it charges quickly. It has really good, uh, decent range. And the best part about it, it doesn't drive that much differently than its gas version. It's turbocharged, you know, brethren. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you just jump it in and go, right? I think it's just a brilliant setup and a very good vehicle. Um, you know, they're better out there, of course. But I just think for what you get and the fact that they're using the same platform, ah, great, great vehicle. The weird thing about that GV70 Electrified is you never hear or see any ads about it. Nope. You know, it's it kind of just like snuck onto the market almost. Like they had the gas GV70 and the gas GV80 and those made sense. And then they just kind of snuck this little Electrified version in and it's a great car, but you just don't see a lot of promotion around it. And I think a lot of people don't know that this thing exists, that it's it's an entirely different car than the gasoline version, and that it's, you know, it looks the same, but it's got a whole different ethos. So kind of interesting how that works. Yeah, I agree. And and, and it, there is something to be said about the PR over at, uh, at Genesis and what they're doing and why they're doing it. Uh, but I, I would say, you know, there's one really cool thing about it, just, just straight out of the bat. Unlike other uh, vehicles built by Hyundai Kia Genesis, um, it has its charger in the very front of the vehicle in the nose. It's actually kind of hidden in the grill. I, I know that sounds like just a small thing, but it's huge when you have to pull up to a charger and get this thing powered, as opposed to having to go to the side of uh, many of these chargers. It's just so much easier. 
The car itself, I just think, is a brilliant car. I highly recommend if you're looking for an electric car, that one might be worth your while. Yeah, GV70 Electrified is very, very good. GV60 is also good. It's like the slightly smaller brother. And GV60, though, is looks very electric, right? It has a totally different look than... It's about the size of a Kona, right? Yeah, it's like... It's, so it's based on the Ionic 5 and EV6. It's that EGMP architecture. But it's um, very futuristic. So yeah. some people don't like that. Some people just want to kind of blend into traffic. So that's where the 70 comes in. But they're both excellent vehicles. Um, a vehicle that may be a little less excellent, the Equinox LT from Chevrolet. One LT, 6% um, savings, $31,000. Well, it's important to mention that the Equinox is going through a major change. Is Yeah, that's right. And we have the EV now, mm -hmm. the fully electric Equinox Which EV. Which we just did a video on. I believe it's on TFL EV. Um, and that, that, that's a whole different ballgame. Look, the Equinox is just kind of a, yes, it, it's also a player. Uh, yes, it also competes with the RAV4 and the CRV. Um, and if you look, it's still a big seller for General Motors, but I think a lot of that has to do with fleet sales. Yeah, no, for sure. And it was recently updated. You're right about that. I haven't driven the new one. Still pretty good value, actually. 31000 if you can get into an all-wheel drive Equinox through June 3rd. Mm -hmm. It's kind of all, you know, $31,000 in today's money is pretty on pretty much on the low end, especially for a good-sized SUV. Agreed, so, agreed. So pretty good. We also have a couple of Cadillacs on this list, XT5 Luxury. XT6 Premium Luxury, those are both 6% off. Buick Enclave and Audi Q3 as well on this list. So let's move on to some more vehicles, Nathan. In the sports car category, this is kind of a head-scratcher, but it does make a little bit of sense. The um, Ford Mustang GT, potential savings below MSRP 10%, stickering at 41960 So that's actually pretty much what we paid for ours. That is a screaming deal for a vehicle that has that much power mm -hmm. and that type of performance right out of the box. And also, it's the only one. <laughs> it's it. There is there is no other choice in the United States, at least right now, uh, for a muscle car, period. Uh, there's, there's nothing from Dodge. There's nothing from Chevrolet. Unfortunately, if you're looking, really, you have to either look at the Germans or the Japanese or actually the Koreans, too. But really, V8, rear drive... This is it. Yeah. No, you're 100% right. I mean, it's um, interesting, though, that even though it, it's the last one on the market, there are still savings. Yeah. Right? So you think being last that all of the Camaro and the Challenger and the, the Charger buyers would go to Mustang, mm. but, but there's not necessarily that crossover. So we have one of these exact cars, actually. The MSRP in ours was 47 and we paid 42 for it. So it's exactly in line with what this... Uh, what this this chart is, is suggesting here. So yeah, I mean, f five four hundred eighty six horsepower for forty one thousand dollars. It's I mean, come on, it's about as good as you're going to get. That, that really is bang for the buck. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that right now Ford has a ton of new incentives on top of the financial incentives for the Mustang, and that is a driving school. Uh, there's a whole new museum over at Charlotte. There's a whole bunch of new stuff that's sprouting up for the Mustang crowd. And they really want to make sure that you guys are included in their future plans as well. So they're, they're doing a much more inclusive community behind the Ford. We just did a video at the 60th anniversary for the Mustang, uh, which I think is either on TFL Now or TFL Car. And that kind of shows you a little bit behind the scenes of what Ford is planning. Yeah, right. And, you know, what's cool about the Mustang recently refreshed. It's gone very tech heavy with the screens that they yeah. put in this vehicle, which some people don't like. I think it's okay. I understand. But one of the cool things that Nathan um, discovered from this trip that actually made it to our Mustang is that the 60th anniversary, they had all the generations, right? Mm -hmm. And they actually sent over the air a software update. So now we can get the 1968 gauge set in our Mustang. Yeah, a digital cool. representation of it that's yeah. uh, uploaded. What's really cool, and I'll give Ford a lot of credit for it, it's free. Uh, I mean, they could have charged for that. I guarantee you they would have made a little bit of money off that. But it was free to anybody who wanted it, uh, which I think is pretty cool. It was really great. Yep. So we got that for free, which was awesome. Now, moving on to cars, Nathan, um, th the overwhelming thing I'm noticing on this list is a lot of Audi products. So A3, 7% mm -hmm. savings. A4, 12% savings. A8, 17% savings, and A6, a whopping 19% savings on a premium plus 45 uh, TFSI Quattro. 19, almost 20% savings on a brand new A6. 
I mean, they're decent cars, but let's talk about Audi just for a sec. What's the one thing Audi is lacking right now? Um, uh, what? Individuality. Mm. I, honestly, I haven't seen anything really pop from Audi in years, you know, where I'm going, oh, my God, that's a cool-looking Audi. I mean, occasionally you'll see some stuff with their electric vehicle. I think that's a good-looking car, their, uh, the GT. But um, everything else really just bores me, and I think it might be boring other people as well. That's my own personal take. Of course, many Audi fans out there go ahead and, you know, argue with the fact that there are that many vehicles on this list that are going for less. Yeah, I think there's just not a lot of excitement right now around a lot of the um, just, Audi sedans. It's just the styling is just, just boring. And it's now. all the same, right? Exactly. They, they've made them too similar to each other. Like an A4, an A6, and an A8 are just so close. Even the A3 looks like an A6. You know, it, it, if, you, if you spend your money, I think that to a certain degree, you want people to go, oh, okay, yeah, well, you know, that is a really good looking you know, A8. But it, you may be confused for something else, especially yeah. from the front. No, it's true. And and um, th there's just, you know, in this market where it's already hard to sell sedans, mm -hmm. you really have to make your sedan stand out or yes. give it give it added value over the SUV. Agreed. Right? And Audi hasn't necessarily um, done that with, with, I think, some of their, their, their sedans. I mean, A8 is... is a ninety thousand dollar sedan that's a hard sell, right? Um, A six though, you can get in the high fifties with some of these savings. So, mm -hmm. like, there are some crazy values to be had. A four in the low forties, which is you know pretty nuts for a premium vehicle. So, if you do, I mean, they're still capable, comfortable cars. The engineering's remarkable on some of them. I mean, they really do have an amazing all wheel drive system. Their powertrains tend to be extremely powerful. Uh, I mean, they, they really are. Decent vehicles under the skin. My issue, of course, is the fact that they're just not popular for a reason. Yeah, so, you know, 17, 19% savings is crazy. So yep. now is a good time to buy one through at least uh, 6.3 of 2024. Uh, another time to buy a good car is the um, the Hyundai Ionic 6. So this it's a really funky car. It's this little sedan that Hyundai, all electric builds, with this wild, almost beetle-like look to it. 16-plus mm -hmm. uh, percent savings on an Ionic 6 right now. But the, the way to buy these, actually, is not to purchase them outright. The way to obtain one is to lease them. Yes. Because there are some crazy lease deals, like under $300 a month for what's a near $50,000 car. Right. In addition, you can also get the uh, tax rebate if you lease the vehicle. That uh, you know wasn't yeah. built in the United States. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you are eligible for that. Yeah, and look, it's a weird looking car. I think some people really don't like the way it looks, but it still is a vehicle that'll do over 300 miles on a charge, right? So it's it's got a lot of range. It's got a lot of usability. It's very easy. It's a, it's a, it's a nice car to drive. Really nice Smooth. car to drive. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But it's you know it can be had for. For not not a ton of money, mm -hmm. yeah. So really good option if you're looking to lease a new electric car. Actually, Morgan and I, um, she my my new wife has a um, uh, first wife, I should say, <laughs> new and first. Just, I don't know. Say, I, the digger just, really dug a hole there. Just say wife. Wife. Okay. okay just say wife. Normal wife. Um, <laughs> <laughs> still trying to figure out how to say it's that. Sorry, right, you're, you're new to this. It's cool. So we're looking at getting her an electric car because mm -hmm. she has a 45 minute commute each way, um, and we have charging at our place and. And we were looking at, you know, like maybe, first of all, buying new doesn't make any sense because the de depreciation on these cars oh, over it's like a, a couple rock. of years. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. crazy. And we can't afford it. So we were looking at like a three or four year old, like um, Ionic 5. I love the Ionic 5. Or Mustang Mach E or some, something like that. Those are like twenty five to $30,000 cars right. in some cases. But you could also lease one for two thirty nine dollars a month, two sixty dollars a month. And then don't have to take depreciation into account at all. Drive it 10,000 miles a year and then return it. I mean, I was looking at the $89 a month lease on the Leaf that we have yeah. in Colorado, which is crazy. Even you can get a Leaf Plus and still get a really cheap you know, rate and get an okay range. Sure. There is one issue, of course, which some people may or may not have. And that is, I'm personally, I, I hate leasing because you have nothing at the end of it in terms of, you know. Right anything to show for it. But the other side of it is, for some people, it could actually be good for their credit. I mean, you, you really should look into the, uh, you know, what works for you. 
But leasing electric cars makes a lot more sense. Well, so let's look at that LEAF, for example. So the sticker on that car is like $30,000. Ish, ish, yeah. So at 89 bucks for a two-year lease, it was like 20, it's 24 months, and I think it was 20,000 miles over those 24 months. Um, the, the, the total all-in cost with tax, title, registration, all of it was like 3,500 bucks for that two years. If you were to buy that car for 30 grand, in two years, it's gonna be worth 22. Yes. So you're losing $8,000 to drive that car for two years versus leasing it where you're spending $3,500. And there's an addition to that, which is that you don't have to really worry about much maintenance. Yeah. Maintenance is really, as long Very as you keep rotating the tires, uh, they do chew up tires quickly. But if you rotate the tires and keep, well, there's two fluids to worry about at the most. Um, <laughs> but really, that's the, that's one of the that's one of the perks of an electric vehicle. There are plenty of detractors as well, but one of the perks is the fact that you know I had one for three years, and basically I put tires on it and washer fluid. Right. Yeah. No, I, I mean, and Nathan, my, the math I'm going through is like the the Leaf is not a very good car. No, it's it's really at the very bottom. They just and it's not Nissan that's like building a bad car. It's Nissan building an old car. It's just yeah, it's it just it hasn't been updated in a long time. Air cooled batteries. The really cheap one is 150 miles of range, and then you can get the the the, the big battery, the which plus. is like two 12 miles of range for 149 a month. Yeah. Um, but I mean, this for 80, it's 99 dollars a month for a 2024 now, and at this Boulder Nissan. But it's zero dollar down, if I remember right. Tax um, it, are due at signing, but it's a 32 thousand dollar car you're getting for 99 dollars a month, which is nuts. So yeah, it's almost worth it for a longer commute just to pick one of those up because yeah. the money you'll save in gas is, and, is there. Yeah, and look, as long as you don't have to deal with Arctic conditions or <laughs> You know, constant days of 115 degrees. The car is great. It, it'll still handle those things too. Just you'll, at, at, you'll reduce range and performance. But they keep in mind you don't have fast charging like you do on other vehicles. Well, the quote fast charging it's, is it's, 50 kilowatts. It's, it's really 49. Yeah, at that's fast. right, Nathan. You had them for a couple of years. Yeah, I yeah. did. And it, the uh, Chatmo, which is eventually going away. They don't have anything that will work with anything in Tesla so far. So the reality is, is that you're you're not going to be using this to cross the country. However, a lot of people out there just need a commuter, and this could be a good commuter. So that's something to keep in mind. Do you miss your Leaf? I'll tell you what. Um, my boy is going to start driving soon. I know, crazy, right? That's nice. uh, <laughs> and so I'm probably going to buy another old used Leaf. Uh, when we're in Los Angeles, okay, it'll be super cheap. I'll be able. I think I'll actually get some tax incentives for uh, buying an old used uh, electric car. And it's my daughter hit every curb in Denver, Colorado. She bounced it off a tree stump for crying out loud. <laughs> knocked off every wheel cap. You, you saw that. Like I would come back and one day it each progressively would go away, and they were all dented wheels. And she slammed the bottom. She really beat the crap. The car kept going. It was just no problem. Uh, and and it's very few mechanical issues, if really any. So for me, someone who's money conscious constantly, having a 16-year-old drive something that has a limited range um, that I can track digitally, which is also very cool, mm -hmm. um, and also know that this is a really cheap car and so and re relatively safe cars too, by the way. You haven't heard about very many uh, Nissan Leafs uh, exploding or catching fire. So these are all good things. So yeah, I think it would be a very good used car for a first car for a 16 year old. And that's probably what I'm gonna do in a couple of years. Did you um, ever run that thing out of charge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, once. Yeah. Yeah, one time I ran it, I, I, I got it into turtle mode and I just got it off the road and <laughs> oh, no. uh, it, it died completely. This was uh, shortly after I got it because I just wanted to be a jerk and figure out what, you know, how far I could go. And that was, you know, it wasn't great. I think I just went over 100 miles and I did that. And it was on a relatively cold day. So I had my friend <laughs> bumper push me all the way to a charger. Um, and I tried to use regenerative braking to see if I could get more charge into the car. Yeah. It didn't really like it very much. Oh, no. Um, and I got to a charger, plugged it in, and uh, many hours later it was ready to go. And there's no problems. It wasn't, it, it, it still has a reserve that's in it, so it'll still show the digital display and it'll still power itself. Yeah. But it's just not going to go anywhere once it's dead. So, yeah, I did that once and I kind of did it on purpose. <laughs> Should we get back to the list? Yeah, let's keep All going. Right. So, uh, small car deals out there yes. Hyundai Elantra's 10% off for an SEL. Um, the hybrids, same thing, 7%. And the Nissan Sentra, 7%. 
So these are all cars kind of in the low to mid $20,000 range. One vehicle I'm not seeing on this list, which is a really good deal, and it kind of makes sense why there are no discounts, but the, um, the, the Chevrolet Trax. One of the best deals you can get in a car today, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it's not on this list, but if I was shopping for any of these kind of affordable cars, I might even skip like a Sentra and go right to a Trax. I would skip the Sentra and go to the Trax. Yeah. I absolutely would. I think that the Sentra is more comfortable. It absolutely is. The seats in the center, especially if you get the mid and upper level versions, have great seats, a very comfortable, great ride. Yeah, yeah very comfortable. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a good it's a good little car, but the Trax has decent power. It's so far, reliability has been good, even though it's a, a three-cylinder turbo that people are freaking out about. Mm -hmm. But the amount of car you get for the money is really good. And so far, I've been very impressed with this car. And I think a lot of people didn't see this coming from Chevrolet. We just didn't think that they would still build a decent, affordable gas car when they were screaming and yelling that they were going to move over only to battery electric vehicles. Yeah, it's amazing. No, definitely worth looking into a Trax if you want an affordable car. I don't think you're going to get much of a discount on them because they're already so affordable, but uh, really, really good. Ah, but I do know one that might not be on this list that you may be able to get a little bit of a break on, which is related to the Trax, yeah. and that's the Invista. The Invista Ooh. is a nicer version of the Trax. Think of a Trax in a tuxedo, yep. same powertrain, uh, a lot of the same components, but a much nicer package inside. And those vehicles I've been seeing uh, just, just in general that they've been going at or even just under MSRP, you may be able to wheel and deal on those. They're just not as popular as the Trax is. Yeah. So other vehicles on this list, Chrysler Pacifica Touring L, 4% below. Um, we also got vehicles like the Cadillac CT4 and CT5, the Mazda 3 2.5, the Volvo S60. Another vehicle on this list. You know what I haven't seen yet, on, but, but maybe you just have skipped over them. Are all the uh, alphas? I don't think there were any alphas on. This. I thought there were a ton of alphas on the uh, on the initial list. <laughs> no, not on this one. Really? Okay. Yeah, there's uh, there's a couple lists we were looking at to put the story together. Uh -huh. uh, we went with the Consumer Reports one because it's it was the most reputable. But uh, are there deals to be had on Alphas? Almost Nathan? every car they build, yes. Really? Okay. Yeah, every but the, that they sell in the United States, including the Tonale, otherwise known as the Tonale. Um, sorry, I can't help it. It's just it's easy to confuse. But uh, yeah, the the Julia, um, everything, everything that they sell in the United States is currently, uh, you know, you can get for uh, under MSRP, or you can wheel and deal and get them relatively cheap. I I am looking at our local Alpha dealer here, uh -huh. um, Julia Ti fifty one thousand MSRP. The uh, the price that this dealer is offering forty one, so ten grand off, <laughs> five grand off. See what I mean? Five grand, five yeah. grand, four grand. Yeah, so there's, it looks like at least locally, that other list we, we saw that had alphas on here is on to something because even in our area, there are some pretty big discounts to be had. I mean, look, they're just not selling. And okay, I know that reliability is a big question for a lot of people, but I got to tell you that with the exception of the Tonali, which I have not driven, but I've driven its cousin, the, uh, the Dodge, which is mixed results. Um, the Julia is still one of my favorite sedans to drive. Uh, not even, you know, yes, the Quadrifoglio is amazing, but just the four-cylinder turbo, just a great, fun, luxurious, wonderfully handling car. Mm. You know, it's interesting. It, it, uh, the, the thing about the way our dealer m model is set up is that, you know, certain dealers will obviously have better discounts than other dealers. Yeah. But uh, poking around, it definitely seems like the car market is settling down quite a bit. It know? is so far. We are expecting kind of an ebb and flow. So leading up to October, October is usually the time when you're going to see dealerships sw swapping out and using their new inventory and getting rid of their old inventory. That's that golden time. So between now and October, I think you're going to see some pretty good deals, especially there's certain automakers out there that are just simply not selling their vehicles, <coughs> Stellantis. And one of the reasons may be that they've oversaturated the lots or perhaps they're asking too much money for their vehicles. There's a lot of, actually a ton of reasons out there why. Did you see that the Ram CEO left Stellantis? Yes, yes, he left after a, a 32 bad audition. years. Yeah, he, he left on his own accord. I know some people thought he was fired because he did really bad acting <laughs> when he was doing the uh, Ram introduction for the RHO, and it was pretty horrible. It was cringy. But no, he, he, he retired on his own. I'm sure he had a nice golden parachute, and he's done. 
And uh, yeah, we're going to see what happens. The person they brought in to replace him used to be the head honcho over at Chrysler, mm. which was selling one car. And now they're going from Chrysler, the least profitable entity at Stellantis, to Ram, one of the more profitable entities at Stellantis. So do you take that president and move them there? I don't know. We're going to see what happens. Well, Nathan, we're going to be sure to follow up as things progress over mm -hmm. at Stellantis. But we do have some Patreon questions. Ah, let's so away. if you want to um, ask us questions, you're welcome to do so. Become a Patreon member, uh, patreon.com slash T, I don't even remember what the URL was, Nathan. Yeah, it's, it's a Patreon. Yeah, I think it's TFL, TFL Car. It yeah. is Car. And that's the only one we have. Yep. Um, but we uh, we answer truck questions and off-road questions and all of that over at uh, Patreon. You can ask Tommy about his marriage and whether or not he actually classifies his wife as a new wife or a first wife. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help Listen. <laughs> so it was too good. Listen, listen. Um, so you actually got a great comment from Dave over at Patreon who sent us a note. Um, it was about your conversation of EV versus hybrid versus ICE. Mm, yes. Um, Dave liked Roman's point about having the right tool for the job. Mm -hmm. um, I would agree with that. Yep. And um, it seems like um, Dave said you all have educated me on EVs. Four years ago, I wasn't sure about EVs, but after watching DFL, I've really come around. And just like Roman said, it's the best tool. If it's the best tool for the job, why not consider it? Yeah, and I think that's true, Dave. Like, we are all both big um, gasoline people, mm. but we also understand that, like, for my current nut wife, my current wife, just to say what? Just, <laughs> don't, you don't have to say current. <laughs> um, she has realized that an EV would work best for her needs, mm -hmm. and even though we like gas cars, I think it's going to be a good fit for her. Yeah, I was telling you about my daughter and, and Dave. Yeah, like just like your daughter. Yeah, yeah just it's it, it's it can be a very good tool, provided that you have the right uh, parameters. You know. And Dave was a uh, a former Fiat X19 owner. Oh, those were cool. The the uh, wedge of cheese. Yeah, and he said if they come out with a reasonable lease on a 500e, I might be crazy enough to give it a try. Mm. I think they will actually have some pretty good lease weight. The, the, the only way they're going to be competitive is by having that vehicle with good lease rates, mainly because the battery is not US sourced <clears throat> and also because frankly they're not very cheap. You can get a Hyundai Kona EV for less money. Yeah, they're like thirty-four to thirty-seven grand. So yeah. that's a lot of money for a little tiny car. For for something that doesn't have, a, I mean, it's a cool car. I drove one. I drove great. It's a great driving car. We had one over at the studio recently. Yeah, and it was a, it was a blast. But there are other vehicles out there that are more utilitarian and just as you know, same price, if not even less. Um, so one of our Patreon supporters. <laughs> Excuse me. Pardon One of me. our pa Patreon supporters, Jeff, um, asked us a question. He says, hey, guys, big fan of the videos. I'm looking for either a Jeep Wrangler or Ford Bronco. He's actually cross-shopping the two. Yeah. And he says, I have a budget of $40,000, so it's going to be on the lower end of the spectrum. Indeed. Which of the two do you think is better at the lower end of the price spectrum? Mm. Okay. Um, so what you're looking at for $40,000... Most likely, you're looking at two doors on both of them. Most likely, yeah. You're probably right, Nathan. Which is a good thing because those are the more off-road capable ones. They have a much better uh, breakover angle. Yeah. Uh, and just you're more maneuverable and lighter. Uh, it also means you're going to be looking at the four cylinders, at least with the the um, the Bronco. I, I, I think the Jeep, is it less expensive to get the, the, the turbo or is it less expensive to get the V6? It usually depends a little bit based on, you know, which configuration. But... Typically, the four-cylinder is what you're going to find more of. Well, actually, what you're going to find everything of now. Realistically, this gentleman is going to have to go out and probably order one. Mm -hmm. Because poking around in our local areas, especially with Jeeps, right, dealers primarily are only getting four by E's in the stock. Which are extraordinarily expensive. Yeah, that's going to be over $50,000. Yeah, I least. think the least expensive one hits just a hair under. It's the Willis... Yeah, there's version. like the sport. I think technically it's fifty thousand, but when you look at like the tax incentives, you're you going to be, be under to... fifty. Yeah. Yeah, but still, it's just way too much. So you'll, yes, once again, you will have to order. Uh, and then the other question is, do you want to go manual? Manual transmission versions of those vehicles, I think, are available only on the V6 version of the Jeep. Yeah, you got it. But I believe you can get a manual with the four-cylinder turbo from Ford. Uh huh. Yeah, it's a seven-speed. Yes. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, 
but let's let's go into the nuts and bolts of it. So around forty thousand dollars, off road capability, on road capability. I will always say. And it's because of the straight axles and the overall size of the vehicle that I think that the Jeep might have a slight edge, and I mean slight, over the Bronco off-road. However, it, realistically, on-road, the Bronco is a far superior vehicle. Even the two-door, it's more comfortable, it handles better. Altogether, it's it's just a better vehicle. But the Jeep off-road, I think, if, you, if you're comparing exactly the two same style, or, you know, comp- uh, comparable styles or... Uh, trims, I think that the Jeep might have just a slight edge. Yeah, I mean, the unfortunate fact of the matter is, if you if you go strictly based on, uh, you know, the, I'm not, I'm not the compare model right now on, on mm-hmm. Ford, right? And if we scroll all the way left, they don't actually advertise the base model anymore. So you have to start at a big bend, and a two-door big bend is 39.630, and, and that's... But you still get tires and suspension for that. <laughs> the steering wheel. But, oh, no, yeah. I mean, but you get the beefier oh, tires on the Big Ben. Uh, well, you get, like, the better wheels and you get, like, yeah, some trim there, stuff. there's a little bit more going on. Whereas Wrangler, you know, two-door, you're going to be in the low 30s starting. Yeah, that's um, a good point. So you are going to save some money going Jeep to Ford. I think that for me, from an on-road standpoint, if I'm primarily driving an on-road, I think you're you're bang on the money, Nathan. The the Bronco is just a much more livable vehicle Agreed. on the street. It's like a little modern pickup truck. Yeah, it's just easier to, to use and to live with. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the Jeep thing is a lot of fun. I, I think that the Jeep, even though it was updated for 2024, I think it really could use some more updates. Agreed. You know, it still feels, unless you're on like the really high end of the spectrum, it still feels a little behind where it should be. Um, considering its price point. Not quite as comfortable. Now, I love, don't get me wrong, I love Wranglers. Um, but we recently spent a long time in a Gladiator bouncing around off-road in it. And um, according to Jeep nowadays, it's now a Wrangler with a bed as opposed to it not being that from, uh, it's a long story. Yeah. Okay, anyway, the point is, is that um, both Roman and I, I mean, and Tommy, we're all, we're all tall people. You know, we're all over six feet tall. And I, I think you would agree, even with the electric seats, it's not Super as comfortable as, as the Ford. No, it's not as comfy, no. So yeah. so for me, I think in this current age, I would be leaning more toward the Bronco than the Jeep on the lower end of the spectrum, if you can even find a Bronco for forty grand, right. which is going to be darn near impossible. So The Jeep seems like a better bet for the, the, Jeep, for the money. And honestly, it might be the only way to go. Because, look, they got rid of, as far as I can tell, they got rid of the base model on the Bronco. So now it starts at 39. I think maybe it's just for this year, though. So, yeah, but in the Jeep, right, you have two-door Sport for 32, four-door Sport for 36, two-door Sport S for 35, and then four-door Sport S for 40. So you have a lot more choice in terms Agreed. of trim. Yeah. yeah, you really do. Yeah, so... There so, it is. Yeah. So, so the Jeep seems to be the way to go if you want more for your money. Now, the other thing I might pitch to you, Nathan, yes. and to, to this gentleman, is... If you want the Bronco experience for under forty grand, consider the Bronco Sport. Mm. Bronco Sport, for those of you who don't know, is it's loosely based on the uh, Ford Escape, more uh, or less. Yeah, yeah, so similar platform, also similar platform and, and some components to the Ford Maverick. And we've taken one off road several times. I just recently really off roaded one, really being like a moderate trail. And that's probably the extent of its capability is moderate to slightly difficult trails, but it can do it. And it can do it better than almost anybody else out there. It actually has a rear end that will lock up. Mm -hmm. It actually has a transmission that responds, I think, beautifully and good power for a little guy. Uh, It's not perfect, um, but it is a very good vehicle for light off-roading. And the best part is, is that you still have the inherent goodness of a car. So it drives like a car on the highway and it gets pretty decent mileage for what it is. Yeah, like the top doesn't come off, no. right? And the doors, well, they're not supposed In to come theory, off. In theory, you can pull them off. Um, but you can get a huge number of Bronco Sports for under 40 grand, mm-hmm. still get a lot of capability for outdoor fun. So Big Bend, you know, starts at 30. Heritage, 32. Outer Banks, 33. I mean, Badlands, right, that has the tow hooks and, and the underbody stuff, 38. So you can you can get a lot more Bronco Sport for the price than you could ever full-size Bronco. And once again, we've really had a chance to bash these things around quite a bit mm-hmm. at, at, at a variety of different uh, terrains and, and locations. And they've proven to be very good. Yeah, so really, really good. Um, so, Nathan, we got one more question sure. here. 
Let me pull it up on Patreon. So this guy says, um, hey, guys, his, his name is Paul. Thank you, Paul, for your support. He says, hey, guys, big fan of the channel. been watching for a bunch of years now. Um, I'm going to kind of summarize here. But Paul is basically looking for an affordable, fun car. So he's looking for a car under $15,000 that's used with ideally two seats. But he's looking at a couple of options. He's looking at a used Mazda Miata. Mm-hmm. He's looking at a Fiat 500 Abarth. Mm. Do you remember the 500 Oh, Abarth? I certainly do. Yeah, yeah. And he's also looking at older Mustangs. And he says, which of the three would you recommend? And when I'm missing anything, he doesn't want it to be more than 15 years old. And he's trying to spend around under $15,000. There is one that you did forget uh, or, or just yeah, perhaps uh, we should remind you of. And that is one of Tommy's favorite cars, which I'm surprised he doesn't have six of right now in the garage. And that is the Mini Cooper. I do like my Minis. Yeah. Uh, there are – now. Uh, bear in mind there are some years that are better than others or some powertrains that are better than others. But you can get a pretty decent model that's a lot of fun for under fifteen grand. Now, in terms of the Miata versus Abarth versus Mustang, I mean, there's there's a there's a lot of gray area there, right? Because yeah. we don't. Are you talking about a V8 Mustang? You talking about a four cylinder turbo Mustang? Uh, and then with the Abarth, <laughs> I love the Abarth. It's it's a silly car. It's it's ridiculous, but they're actually pretty well bolted together. You might actually be surprised to see how many are still on the road. They're better in terms of their overall fit and finish than a lot of their brethren. Uh, that's including vehicles like the uh, Fiat 500X and L. Uh, the L for loser, the X as in nobody ever wanted it. Uh, but the Fiat 500, the regular 500, and the 500 Abarth, uh, really fun cars. But if you really want something that's going to handle, that has that reliability, reliability built into it, and is economical. Really, the only thing about it is it's not utilitarian. It's the Mazda Miata. If you're serious about fun and he- going cutting through you know the mountains, Miata is the way to go. And that's every generation. Yeah. No, I mean, they're so different, right? But for me, I mean, I think the Mini is a fun choice. But yeah. um, for me, I think Miata is the way I would go. Mm. I think it gives you a very unique experience over a, a traditional family car, right? Well, yeah. Not that a Mustang isn't or that. The Fiat definitely is, but it's 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 a vehicle that that really feels special when you get into it. Yeah, um, and and that's why I would go um, Miata. I, I think that it's just going to well, deliver the most fun. And one final point on that is that if if you're cool with having very little storage, yes, Miata's fine. If you, however, you want a little bit of storage, an actual trunk, and maybe a back seat. Maybe the Mustang's worth looking at, but if you're looking at a Mustang under fifteen thousand dollars, that's not that old. You may be able to get, uh, I think, a four or five year old Mustang with the four cylinder turbo that they yeah. introduced. You may be able to find one of those, and they were quick. I mean, they had about three hundred horsepower, and you know, they were decent. But for just ridiculous fun, because the sound and everything else, and if you need to store a little bit of stuff and occasionally take a person with you. The Fiat 500 Abarth is so stupid fun. Yeah. And, and it's, cheap. They're cheap now. They're super cheap. And, and yeah. just, they're, they're so rewarding, the sound and the feeling of them. And they're quick. So I still i am on the side with Tommy with the Miata. However, there are caveats with this. Yeah, no. I mean, it's also hard to get a good V8 Mustang. Uh, Even a 10-year-old Mustang for under 15 is going to be a really big, big push. Yeah, that's exactly my point. So, yeah, I mean, you are you get better value by, like, if you, the Fiat sounds amazing. I do worry about its long-term reliability, but it does sound amazing, and it is super fun. Mm-hmm. But, you know, pick one of those up for eight, nine grand, and you're going to have $6,000 left in the bank to, to fix <laughs> to, it. To fix it. When it breaks, that'll at least get you a few miles down the road. Those little snarly engines so far have been really, I mean, it, it they're not screaming and yelling that they're exploding left and right. right? <laughs> good. Oh, that's yeah, good. Yeah, so that, that's a good thing. Oh, by the way, if you and there's another option with the Fiat, and that is there's a regular Fiat 500 that had a turbocharged engine but without all the glitz. And it wasn't quite as powerful as the Abarth, but it was they didn't make that many of them. But I think it was just known as a 500 turbo. And uh, oh, yeah, yeah remember those? And yep. uh, they're out there as well. Now, I know a guy who's got a regular 500, who's got 250,000 miles on it, and the only issue he's had is a starter and the brakes. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. And he's in Los Angeles. Oh, that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Really good. Yeah. So, Nathan, we have a list that you put together of your forever cars. 
Ah, yes. And um, here, I can pull it up on my phone here. Now, bear in mind that list was was, was partially to mess with you, Tommy. Initially, I was going to add in like a nine, uh, 1898 uh, Oldsmobile Curve Dash or whatever the first generation. <laughs> 1904 yeah. Curve yeah. Dash. Sorry, 1904, yeah. yeah. Um, so you have lifetime cars, cars we'd be willing to spend the rest of our lives Basically, with. if we had to have just one car to drive every Shit. single day. <laughs> and you could, I mean, yes, you could drive other cars, but, th- but this is your main car. This is your driver. What would it be? Your list starts out pretty good and then goes downhill very quickly. Well, there's a reason for that. Okay, so so go go through number five here. Okay, Toyota Land Cruiser. Pretty much every Land Cruiser leading up to the one that's currently out today. And why am I not including the one out today? Because I haven't driven it, so I don't know. Mm. But Toyota Land Cruisers, many people would agree. Big Toyota fans out there would say, like, yeah, that's that's my only car. That's that's what I will drive forever. And in many cases, it might actually last forever. Yeah, I mean, the, I, I, I agree with that. I, regardless of the series, 80, 100, 200, whatever, they're just fantastic cars, very capable, comfortable, long-lived. I'm, I'm on board with it so far, Nathan. I think that's a good one that you could live with forever. Do you like the Pignos? Um, like the like the 55, where they have the weird round headlights? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean... I thought those were kind of cool looking. They, they drive pretty good. I've driven one of them before, and I, they, it was actually pretty... It's it's old. Like, it's over 50 years old now. Yeah. But they are they're pretty good. Yeah. I, I just kind of dig the way they look. The Iron Pigs, yeah. Yeah, those, yeah. Those are, Iron those are Pigs, interesting. Yeah. Uh, so now, uh, the next one is a choice for moi. Okay. Uh, now, as you know, I am a huge fan of the... Mitsubishi Montero. Yep. I've owned technically four of them, but really driven three of them. <laughs> we won't talk about that fourth one, will we? Um, no, so I've had just about every terrible. generation, but one that I haven't had, which was not he- available here in the United States, was the Pajero Evo Evolution. Mm-hmm. And essentially what that was was a slightly toned-down version of their full-on rally raid version of the Montero. Now, by the way, uh, the Montero, the Pajero, uh, won uh, to cart. 12 times, the most of any automaker and auto name in the world, and for a good reason, because they know how to build a really good off-roader. So this particular version of it, and I've heard from other people, is just take everything you know about off-roading and just throw it out the window. This thing is stupid fun. It's really fast, and it's something that I could drive my entire life. Uh, But realistically, let's say I couldn't afford that, which most lucky I couldn't. I would still take my first generation Montero, which was, I think, an 88 that I had, Okay. which was the two-door. Yeah, that was cool. And I, I, I could drive that forever and be very happy. It was such a good... Really? It was perfect for me. Even today, where you're at in your life, you think that would still be I think fun, it would yeah. be absolutely awesome. And that one that I had was the four-cylinder, which got okay mileage, which in Los Angeles means I'll only be spending a couple thousand dollars a month on gas. <laughs> um, so, Pajero Evo is very cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really homologated. Cool. Yeah, it was awesome. Number three, Cadillac Catera. Yeah, perfect for your dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Roman would love that, especially because they had a manual transmission option that a lot of people didn't know about. This was like when Cadillac was trying to go after like BMW. Oh, they, they did such a small... horrible job. Yeah. They called it the Cadillac that zigs. And the best part about it, I, I don't know who what ad agency they hired. I'm, I'm glad they fired them. Um, they actually had a little duck. This little cartoon duck as part of the image. So you know the shield for Cadillac? Yeah. It kind of popped out of the shield, and you had this little duck. So all these Cadillac people back then who were like, you know, it's, it's you know the art, and it's the science, and it's, you know, it, it's U.S., the, the American version of Mercedes and everything else. And also you got this little cartoon <laughs> duck bouncing out of this little Cadillac that was really unloved. Awesome. Um, but I think that it would be perfect for Roman. You, okay, so that not for you, but for Roman. Right. Okay. I, I, I got one I for Roman, agree. I got one for you, and I got another one for me. Okay, so number two, is this is this for you? Yes. Okay. What do you got? One of the best hatch, hot hatchbacks I've ever driven in my entire life, Peugeot 205 GTI. The one I drove was a late 80s model. I know I'm stuck in the 80s, sorry, guys. <laughs> but it was so much fun. The car was the most responsive car I've ever driven. Yes, I had to drive it overseas. Uh, I've even driven the base model, the, not the, the regular I version of it, and it was still fun. Wonderful platform. The car communicates with you. It's one of the best steering vehicles I've ever driven that was front-wheel drive. Um, and the, the GTI version of it was quicker. And it's just different than the Volkswagen GTI, which would be another choice. I think it's a great car, the early ones. But this thing was just so much fun, so rewarding. And I remember I was getting like 35 miles per gallon in the damn thing. It was really impressive. Yeah, I mean, obviously one of the most iconic rally cars in in history. 
Um, and, and I think they're great looking. Yeah, certainly, like, I think by modern standards, it would be pretty slow, right? Yeah. But but very interesting car and, yeah. and very cool. Your number one, though, is a little curious. That's Tommy's. Stanley Steamer. Hell yeah, for you. <laughs> That's my forever Out power. of this room, who's the one who bought a vehicle over 100 years old? That wasn't me. That was <laughs> you. And you love the old stuff. You're an anachronism walking. So Stanley Steamer, how many people have those? Very few. Leno. Yeah. Right, and maybe Very one or few. two of his, his drinking buddies. That's it. Yeah. So I think that Tommy needs to get a Stanley Steamer and drive it forever. I would like to drive one. A little nervous of, about them over, exploding. Oh, it, 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 you only hear about it occasionally when it lights a celebrity on fire. <laughs> Come on. So it, usually they're okay. It's just when they light a celebrity on fire. Do you know fire. at one point in time Stanley Steamers were outselling uh, gas vehicles? They were very popular. They were very popular. Yeah, they were. And up here in Colorado, we have a direct connection with Stanley Steamer, and that's because the Stanley Hotel, the Stanley family, yeah, that's the same family as the Stanley Steamer. They have one in their basement, don't they? They do indeed. They have a steam car museum, Nathan? Set to open fall 2011. Oh, I'm not sure. (laughs) Oh, Tommy's there. Um, I do think they're very cool. Yeah, I, I would. You really? They got a Stanley Steamer fire truck. I, I I would like to to drive one and maybe own one for. Aha! Yeah, now we're right. getting there. So was I wrong? No, now, you're now on your the dad money. might 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 disagree with the Cadillac Catera, but I think that's his perfect car. And remember, he's he's like some weird cars, like the Buick. Um, oh, he loves a Cascada. Cascada. Yeah. The he, he convertible. W- remember? Yeah, and then the Cadillac. El- the ELR. ELR, that was it. That's it. He yep. loved that too. Yeah, he I does. Mean, and nobody else does. And then, he just, he comes out of the woodwork and he just like, this is a car I want. And you're like, you want that one? Really? He had a Jaguar X type. type. Mm-hmm. Loved it. Yeah. And most people out there are like, oh wait, isn't that a Ford? Yes, it is. <laughs> but he loved it. So he has kind of a quirky sense as well. So I think a Cadillac Catera is right up his alley. I think you're right. I think I'll pitch For the rest of his life. All right. I'll drive the Stanley. You drive your Peugeot. And yeah. Like, yeah no, I actually really want to drive my Mitsubishi. Well, folks, let us know what you think in the comments below. What is your forever car? We'd love to... Uh, to hear your input on this conversation. Indeed, we do it. And also, were any of those cars interesting to you on that list? Is there something that you're going to pursue because of what we said? The best deals, Nathan. You're Some right. Some pretty good deals out there. I'm curious to whether or not that's actually going to be something you're going to look into. So yeah. let us know in the comments below. No, for sure. And we'd love to hear um, all your comments where we read them all. And big thank you to our Patreon followers, patreon.com slash TFO car. You guys make this podcast happen. And we'll see you next time. Bye, Dios.